Hey there, neighbors and naysayers. It's Clint Finney again for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council web update for February the 11th, 2021. Hey, we had a good video there from Kevin two weeks ago and uh, wanted to kind of add on to that and also had some questions come in about frost seeding and soil testing. So I wanted to cover a little bit of that uh, before we go on to our next Eastern Ohio Grazing Council pasture walk here at the end of February. So let's get started. I titled this set 2020 in review and I know that may not seem like a very interesting topic, but I, I, I personally take January, February and March and kind of look over what we did in the year prior and, and try to figure out what, what we went wrong, where we did things right and, and what we need to do better for the, the coming year, in this case being 2021. Uh, this is a good time to look over our paddock records, if we've kept any, uh, to look over our yields, to look over our fields and what we did and, and fencing and all those different things. Uh, there's lots of downtime this time of year as far as daylight hours go. And, and it's just a good time to look back in review and, and figure out where we can do things better. And I included this picture of steers because I said, uh, when I took this, th this is why I run those steers kind of over the pasture fields one last time after the cows have gone uh, to hay for the winter is because it gives me one last review of those fields and, and lets me figure out what I need to do different next year to make those fields a little better. And then thinking more on what we need to do better in 2021. You know, it may be a water line. It may be a well-placed fence. It may be another hydrant. It may be a frost-free trough. It may be setting our fields up in such a way that we know when we get to winter, we're gonna be unrolling in a particular field or bale grazing in a particular field. But in January and February and March, sometimes it's hard to get motivated, but the, the secret to getting ahead is getting started and, and getting started planning in January, February and March is a great way to get our year off on the right foot. So I said at the beginning, I, I was going to kind of add on to Kevin's uh, kind of talk there two weeks ago. And, and I think it's important for all of us to sort of set goals. And, and there again, I know that's not the most interesting of topics. It's not the most easy thing to do. But I, I encourage all of you to sit down and think about what do you really want to get done? What do you really want to get done this year and, and the following years for that matter? when do you want to get it done write a date put a date on that and, and I, I read somewhere that uh, somebody said not only write it down not only write a date but put it somewhere where you're going to see it quite often I, I know of a farmer that has his goals up on the mirror um, in his bedroom and so it's somewhere that he looks at every day now I don't know many farmers that look in a mirror uh, but the window front window of a pickup truck is also another good place for somebody to always see it uh, I have things hanging up on my desk at work uh, that kind of remind me uh, of my goals and what I'm working toward. And by putting a, a year or a date on those particular goals, it sort of makes us feel uncomfortable. And that's a good thing uh, because that, that kind of puts some pressure on us. It puts us pressure on us to, to get started. And, and I think that's sort of where Kevin was going uh, with talking about working smarter and not harder is getting our goals kind of set and kind of figured out where we want to go. And then, you know, there, there are lots of different goals that a grazer may have. Uh, I just kind of listed some of some of the ones that I hear the most and just to kind of give an idea of, of some way to write it down. But, you know, I hear I, I want to get more legumes in my pasture in 2021 or, or in the next year. And this is a great goal for, for all of our grazers and all the grazers that we work with. Too often I walk pasture fields that are pretty devoid of legumes. So all of us should kind of work toward that goal. I want to go to a three day grazing period or a one day grazing period or a 12 hour grazing period in 2022. And so I need to work through 2021 in order to get myself there. And I think too, we have to realize if we're going to set a goal, especially for if it's a hard thing to get accomplished, sometimes it's okay that that takes two or three years to get out and get done. And then after that, one of the ones we're going to be talking about here over the next year is I want to be able to graze 270 to 300 days out of the year. And that will take several years to get there. 
Uh, I'm I'm currently in the middle of about a three year span of, of a five year plan of trying to get there. I don't know that I'll make that five year plan. It may take me a couple more years, but at least I'm working toward that goal. Some of you may be thinking how does soil testing fit into a year review and our goals. And I think all of us should have as a goal in, in 2021 and every year for that matter, to take the soil tests that need to be taken. Uh, we tell folks that we should take a soil sample every three years. Uh, in some cases where we're spreading lots of manure, we may wanna take that sample every year. Uh, but I try to put our soil samples at home on a three year rotation. So I'm always taking a set of soil samples. And so when that springtime comes, typically for me, if it's best right at the beginning of the grazing season, because that's when I have the most amount of time to go out and take soil samples, uh, it could work for you in the fall if you've got more time then, but we always want to take those samples the same time each year. But I try to put them on a rotation, so I'm taking a third of the samples I need every year. So it's something that I do every single year and keep up on and keep to date. All right, so just some quick guidance on soil testing. Uh, we want to go out and take 20 cores per soil sample. Now this can be with a soil probe or those sweatless soil samplers they show online and use a drill bit and a hole in the bottom of a five gallon bucket. But we wanna take 20 different core samples per soil sample. We also wanna make sure we collect those 20 cores in a clean non-metallic container. So not a metal bucket, in a plastic bucket, in a clean plastic bucket. We don't want any outside material to influence our soil sample. Uh, this is just a way to, to get a more representative sample of the field. Uh, we wanna take those at random. So I've seen farmers use golf clubs and a golf ball and take the sample everywhere the golf ball lands. I've used a Frisbee. I just kind of randomly went out and taken samples off the four wheeler, just kind of making sure I got different parts of the field and different things uh, represented. Uh, the hard part about me going out and doing it and not having some random thing I have to follow is I tend to either sample what will be the higher uh, nutrient value areas of the field or the lower. And, and for me, it typically tends to be the lower uh, end of the field, where if I would have somebody from outside of my farm come and take samples, I would get a more representative sample because they wouldn't know uh, enough about the field to, to be able to get the low parts or the high parts of the field. So we want to make sure that that's random. We want to sample those uh, cores to a four to eight inch depth. Uh, I, I know that the guidance is kind of fuzzy there. Uh, four to eight inches is a huge range. And it used to be, we said for pH, we wanted to take it to a four inch depth. And for the actual nutrient levels, we would take it to an eight inch depth. Uh, and that was in our days when we were plowing fields. And there's a, a million different sets of guidance out there and, and uh, for no-till and, and for pasture, they say four inches, but I took a bunch of soil samples here a couple of years ago and took them both to a four and eight inch depth and sent them into the lab. And I didn't find that there was that much different. Our pastures were working. If, if we've got forage that's growing eight inches, 10 inches, 12 inches tall, uh, we don't have that trouble. It, it, the nutrient level is gonna be about the same. Then we want to make sure we have less than 20 acres represented in each sample. So if we've got a, a field that's that big, that's fine. If we've got a field that's bigger, we want to split that into two different representative samples, probably by soil type or by top, topography. Um, but for most of us, that's not really a problem because our fields are smaller than 20 acres. And so then I get the question all the time, can I lump these soil samples together? My first answer is, if we've never taken a soil sample from them before, we probably want to take a, a separate sample first. Uh, then, if those soil samples come out to be the same, then from then on, we can kind of lump those fields together. Uh, my other rules are, you know, if, if it's under different management or has been under different management, say we fed hay on one one year and didn't feed hay on the other, then those are two different fields. But if our management has been the same and our soil types are relatively the same, we can go ahead and lump those together once we've had a, a test to show us that the levels are about the same. Good to keep them separate first. Once we know that they're sort of testing about the same, then we can kind of put them in the same sample. After we've taken those 20 cores, we want to bring them in, put them out so they can air dry. Uh, I take my samples in a Kroger grocery bag usually. Bring them in, put them in a bowl, and let them air dry for a while. Uh, then I Go through, break up the clumps, uh, take out any non-soil material. So uh, big 
rocks, big stones, um, horn material, whatever might be in there, any grass or anything that I've picked up, take it out, mix that sample up, and then you want to take one to two cups of that mixed soil for your actual soil sample. Uh, different labs will require different amounts. Uh, most of them, though, are in that one to two cup range. If you, you get the soil samples that come with a bag, they usually want you to fill that bag so they have enough material to test. You'll have soil left over. Uh, and, and if you're taking your soil sample correctly, that's okay. You're, you're supposed to have some left over. Then you can return that back to the field. You can use it in flower pots. You can do whatever you want with it. Uh, but we want to have more soil in our representative sample than what we're actually going to send to the lab. And then we need to make sure we fill out the sample sheet correctly. Um, some soil samples come with a pretty involved sample sheet. Some of them have none at all. I've sent soil samples in to labs that all I had to do was put my name and field number on the bag and they did all the rest. Uh, some of them want to know yield history and all those things. Uh, and then <clears throat> fill it all out, put it in an envelope. I like to take soil samples all together in one big batch because I can put it in one of those boxes down at the post office and they ship it for the same price. Uh, and then the waiting game starts, um, waiting for your results to come back. And they'll send a the result back. Typically, um, if you filled out a, a big sample sheet, it'll have your yield goals on it and, and also some recommendations. Uh, if you didn't fill out a sample sheet, typically all it'll have the soil, is the soil sample itself. But just know that we, we'll be more than willing to help you both fill out that sample sheet so that it gets done correctly. And then also go over your soil sample results with you, uh, just so we get a feeling for what your soils are. And, and we make sure that, that you're doing the right things or, or, or making sure you're shooting for the correct yield on the soil that you're currently working with. The next one I get questions about every year uh, is frost seeding or seeding legumes. Uh, and it's become kind of a joke uh, around here with Eastern Ohio Grazing Council folks. Uh, about every every year there's a presentation about frost seeding um, and I have times when uh, my love for frost seeding is pretty good and times when I really don't care for it all that much and I'd rather do it some other way but um, frost seeding is a good way to get legumes out there on the on your fields the problem I have with frost seedings and, and there are many is that uh, people think that they can just go out and spread seed and, and it'll therefore grow um, when Really, we, we've got some things that we have to be concerned about with, with seeding legumes, no matter whether it's frost seeding or planting them with a drill. Uh, first is that the, the pH of, of our soil needs to be at six, six and a half, seven, to really give those legumes a shot at growing. And that's why we talked about soil sampling before we talked about planting legumes or planting anything for that matter. Um, but it, it has to be at that neutral, sort of neutral range to give those legumes a shot. Uh, next, for, for alfalfa, especially if we're trying to plant alfalfa, our, our phosphorus level needs to be at 25 or 30 to really give that alfalfa a chance to grow. Now, white clover, red clover, bird's foot trefoil, it'll grow at a lower kind of nutrient level, uh, but alfalfa especially has to have some nutrients to be able to grow off of as well. And then outside of that, we've got to have some openings in our pasture sword. If you go out there in the field and, and look down at your feet and you can't see any openings in the soil, uh, it's not going to be a good field to put a frost seeding on. Uh, we actually sometimes have to hurt our fields a little bit, for lack of a better term, uh, to be able to make them receptive to, to frost seeding. So that if there's not enough open space, uh, this picture in the background here, uh, that was frost seeded and I got a frost seeding, but but the way that field looks right now, you cannot see any openings in the, the sward. You wouldn't be able to put any, there's nowhere for seed to go. So you've got to have an actual opening for the seed to, to be able to hit the soil and make seed to soil contact and grow. And the last thing is with a frost seeding, we really need to put uh, an additional 50% more seed down than we would if we were going to do it with a drill. Uh, so for me, if, if the soil conditions are right, the field conditions are right, I can get away with renting a drill for the cost in the extra seed it would take for me to frost seed. We don't always get a, a good field conditions or good soil conditions to be able to use a drill. So that's where frost seeding fits. We can run across the ground when it's frozen or frosted and, and it'll hold up the equipment and we can spread the seed and we don't have to worry about renting equipment and all that. But 
cost wise, a lot of times renting a drill or doing frost seeding, they're about the same because of the increase in seeding cost. So if we're going to do a frost seeding, like I said, we have to have the soil conditions right. The pH has got to be right. We need some nutrients in that soil. We need to make sure there's an opening for that to, to hit. We really want to do those frost seedings sometimes after the first of the year up to about March 15th. Uh, I've done some frost seedings after March 15th. But those frosts that we get in March and April uh, haven't been very successful. Sometimes you'll see an increase in legumes right away. Sometimes you'll see it a year or two down the road. Sometimes you won't see any. Uh, but we really want to do it sometime January, February, early part of March. Best if done like on a one inch snowfall because then we can follow our tracks. We know where we've been. We can kind of gauge how far apart we're going uh, and we don't get heavy application on one part of the field and light on the other. We get a more uniform spread if we can follow our tracks. Same can be said in a field that's got some grass, some height to it. So you can kind of follow your tracks, but on a field that's closely grazed where you wouldn't be able to see your tracks, it'd be hard to keep up and keep going straight and, and getting your field spread evenly. And then the, the last thing about a frost seeding is we need to check both our spread pattern and our seeding rate. I like to put seed in the seeder uh, somewhere where I can see the seed being spread and measure the spread pattern. So I know how far apart I have to be driving. And then also I've got a, an area up by the road at our place that is measured because the fence posts are on 30 foot centers. So I go up there every time and test out my seeding rate. I weigh out a pound of seed, put it in the, the seeder and, and make a pass just to make sure that I'm getting the right rate at the right mile per hour on my four wheeler uh, so that I know that I'm, I'm putting the seed out there and being efficient with my time and my money when it comes to seed resources. So. That, that's the way to do a frost seeding. And like I said, you've got to make the decision whether a frost seeding is worth it for you or whether actually getting a drill and, and doing a seeding with the drill is worth it. Like in, in economic standpoints, really, uh, a lot of times we can rent a drill from a local soil and water for the extra increase in, in seed cost that it takes for frost seeding. I, I'm not saying one's better than the other. I'm just saying we have to consider those costs. Okay, so some of you are saying, well, that's great, Clint. You told us how to do a frost seeding, but you didn't tell us anything about a rate. So here, hot off the presses from the Field Office Technical Guide, uh, Appendix A, seeding tables from here to NRCS. Uh, these are the rates that we would recommend uh, planting legumes. Uh, this goes down through uh, a pure stand, three quarter, half, one third, and a quarter rate. And, and for us, where we would be frost seeding legumes into a, an existing pasture, existing grass, we want to stay around that half to one third, preferably the one third rate. Uh, and then remember also, we need to increase that seeding rate by 50% if we're doing a frost seeding. So if, if we've got we've got a list at four pounds per acre to be a third, uh, we need to increase that up to six pounds uh, for a frost seeding. The only forage I see on here that I, I get a question about every once in a while that's not on here is, is crimson clover. And crimson clover can be planted just about the same way that red clover is, or just about the same rate. So I hope that clears it up. We should probably get a link posted also so that you guys can get to this Appendix A as well, uh, just so you can get seeding rates for other grasses, other forages that you might want to plant. Well, that's a wrap for this week's web update. We do thank you for tuning in. Please, if you've got any topics or any points of discussion that you would like for us to cover, we would be glad to hear them. Uh, here in the next week, we're going to be going out and shooting some video in the field. We're excited to be doing a pasture walk in the winter where we typically do in-person, in-class kind of sessions uh, because of not meeting face-to-face. It has allowed us to schedule some time to go out and look at some different grazing operations and how they're handling their winter feeding operations. So we're going to go look at some, some unrolled hay. We're going to look at some stockpiled grass. We're going to look at a heavy use pad and, and some hay storage options. So be looking forward to that. Um, we do appreciate having you guys here and appreciate the feedback that we've been getting. That'll say, we'll see you next time.